So ladies and gentlemen, this is an introduction to our first practical assignment uh, for the 301 course. We are going to analyze fold structures using the stereo nets, and you might remember this photograph of a, a fairly large anticlinal structure from your first year course. We see here a plunging hinge line towards us, and here we see a layer running through the fold closure, through the hinge in this area to the other limb. And, uh, and here we see further layers that don't show that so prominently, but uh, clearly here the block diagram explains the geological situation. We have different layers that are bent in this anticlinal shape. Uh, when we do field work, we would investigate such uh, structures using the geological compass, taking compass readings here on layers on either limb, wherever we find uh, outcrop and good exposure. You uh, might also find uh, exposure in the hinge, but usually your data sets will always uh, document uh, essentially compass readings from the limbs. And using these compass data and the stereo net, you see we will be able to reconstruct the hinge line and the interlimb angle and the orientation of the actual surface. So let's consider such a very simple folded structure and uh, let's assume you have taken compass readings, uh, dip directions, dip angles using the compass in the field. From these data you can uh, plot the poles to the planes. The pole to the plane is the normal direction on each of the surface. And if we are looking at a cylindrical fold, that means a fold that has a straight hinge lines and uniformly oriented uh, limbs, then we will find that the poles to all these planes will fall onto one surface. They all will be oriented so that they can fit it on the surface that we see here uh, in pale yellow in orange color. This surface again has a normal direction to it. So the vertical direction onto this plane is uh, called the pi pole. And this pi pole is parallel to the hinge line of such a cylindrical fold. Now let's plot these data that we have collected in the field onto a stereo net. And if we have uh, such a fold here with two differently oriented limbs, we will find two clusters on the stereo net, each representing one of the limbs. So here, this would be a limb that is dipping with its corresponding grade circles. That would be over here to the southeast. And uh, this limb here would um, dip to the northwest with corresponding grade circles somewhere over here. Now, fitting our data onto a grade circle we have these two clusters and we fit a great circle so that it um, represents best these two uh, fold limbs, uh, we produce a, another surface. This surface is this orange surface here. And this is what we call the pi circle. The pi circle has a normal to it, which we can uh, easily construct using the stereo net that would fall onto this position. Now you just rotate on your tracing paper this great circle to the north-south orientation and from its center you count 90 degrees uh, into the opposite direction of the dip direction you find then the pi pole the normal the pole to that pi circle so these two surfaces here the orange great circle here and the orange plane there they correspond to each other that is uh, the expression of the surface in the stereo net. And here the pi pole falls on a position where also the hinge line would plot. So now we must be careful. This pole to the plane would have the same compass readings like the surface, the great circle to which it corresponds. You might remember that from second year. So this plane here clearly dips fairly steeply to the southwest. More specifically, the reading would be 239.71. That is our pi plane, and therefore that is also the coordinates for the pi pole. Now, if the hinge line plots in this position here, then clearly this linear fabric element has a trend and a plunge that is not 
239.71. The trend is clearly northeast and the plunge is shallow. So how do we convert the pole to the plane reading 239.71 to the corresponding linear coordinates, the trend and the plunge of the hinge line that plots at this place. This is very simple. Uh, we see the linear structure here has 59.19 and we get to these numbers from uh, by a conversion from 39.71. The dip direction of the pi plane is converted into the trend of the hinge line by just adding 180 degrees. If the dip direction is going down to the southwest, the trend of the hinge line plotting at this place is going northeast. 239 minus 180 yields 59 degrees. And this uh, plunge of 19 degrees is uh, calculated from the dip angle of the pi plane to just by subtracting this 71 from 90. That yields 19 degrees. 059.19, that is the orientation of the hinge line. How do we get the actual surface shown here in orange from our data? For that, we need a piece of additional information, and that is the strike of the actual surface. You can get the strike of the actual surface uh, sometimes from geological maps, where you see the large fold patterns uh, cropping out, and there you can measure or estimate the strike of the actual surface, or you can uh, get readings in the field or a bearing in the field. This strike or orientation is what you have to have in addition to the hinge line that we see here. When you look here at the actual surface, the actual surface is defined by a surface connecting the hinge points of several layers of that fold. And also on that actual surface, we see obviously its strike line and the hinge line. The hinge line is also part of the actual surface. Now we know the hinge line, we have to know the strike of the actual surface, and we can plot that strike of the actual surface into the stereo net. Since this is a strike line, it will always plot at opposite points on the perimeter of the stereo net. Here we have that strike of the actual surface plotted. And all we now have to do is construct a great circle that connects the strike orientation, the blue dot, with the hinge line that we see here. That's how it looks like. And uh, once we have constructed this great circle, we can determine its coordinates, its Klar values, 337, 67 in this example. What is missing now is the interlimb angle. We want to construct the interlimb angle. And here, when we have this diagram and we know how our fold looks like and how it is oriented, then the, uh, it is pretty clear the interlimb angle goes from this limb to that limb, has a certain magnitude. How do we construct that in the stereo net? In the stereo net, things are a little bit more complicated. The first thing that we do is we plot the pole to the actual surface. We have here the actual surface in orange. The pole to that plane is this blue dot down here, fairly close to one of the clusters. And uh, when we consider what we see actually in the uh, stereo net, and that is not everything we might see in the field, but if we look just at the stereo net and we have plotted the two limbs, the two clusters for the two limbs, then uh, all we see are two planes. Two such planes, symbolized here in red lines, two such planes have intersection angles. Here an acute one, and here an obtuse one. If we have the graphics of the fold, we know the interlimb angle is here, the blue angle. That is the correct interlimb angle for this fold. But if we only know that there are two intersecting limbs, and we don't know how the fold is oriented, theoretically we could have a fold that goes around here and has a fairly shallow dipping actual surface. Obviously, we need to correctly estimate or determine the interlimb angle uh, across the actual surface. So as it is seen here, from one limb to the other via the actual surface, not from here 
to here where there is no actual surface. In the stereo net, these two possibilities are shown here with uh, arrows, differently colored, colored arrows. The obtuse angle between the two limbs would be shown here in red. And then the, uh, the acute angle would be shown in two segments, the blue one from here to here to the cluster and from the other cluster to the corresponding point on the perimeter. Now, since we know that, that the pole of the actual surface is lying at this place, we need to choose the blue segments, the two blue segments, because the two blue segments include the place where the pole to the actual surface plots. That is important. So never try to determine on the stereo net the angle between two clusters as interlimb angle, unless you have the pole to the actual surface in one of the segments. If our actual surface would be differently oriented, say the actual surface would come from this strike line over here to the other end of the strike line, then the pole to that plane might be somewhere here. Then the red segment would be our correct interlimb angle. But in our example, the pole to the plane falls into one of the blue segments, and that means we measure this angle, 36 degrees, we measure that angle, 47 degrees, we add the two, and we obtain our interlimb angle, 83 degrees in this example. So always check where the pole to the actual surface plots, then choose whether you measure the obtuse or the acute angle in this example the acute one, the two blue segments, 83 degrees. So take all this as an example. Your practice, your exercise uh, today might be different and uh, also polls that you might analyze in the field uh, might be differently oriented. But the principle is, as we have explained, you plot the limb readings, you produce the hinge line uh, from the pi circle, and uh, using the strike of the actual surface that you have to have obtained from field or map work, uh, you can produce the actual surface by fitting the strike of the actual surface with the hinge line on one great circle. Once you've done that, you plot the pole to that surface, to the actual surface, which helps you then to decide which segments of along the pi circle have to be measured as interlimb angles. That's pretty much it. I hope you will be successful with your prank.